So when it comes to real estate investing, there are niches and there are strategies. And you're, you're going to want to get clear on one or two. You, know, you don't want a whole bunch of strategies. You don't want to try to get really good at a bunch of strategies. Same with niches. You want to choose your niche and you want to choose a strategy and you want to go for it and you want to execute on that. Do not try to be master of many. Uh, you will be uh, uh, master of none in that case. So some of the niches are single family investments, uh, small multifamilies, large multifamilies. You know, small multifamilies is like four and under, I would qualify that. Large multifamilies is like five units and over, more or less. Would you guys agree on that? Yep. Okay. Office space, retail, self-storage. Um, these are all niches, right? And then within those niches, there are strategies. So there are buy and hold strategies where you buy a property and you, and you just hold it, right? You buy it and rent it and hold it. There are fix and flip. You can fix and flip a property. It's pretty self-explanatory, right? You buy a property, you renovate it, and then you sell it for a profit, right? Mm -hmm. Development, it's a kind of a higher, uh, higher, higher, a bigger scale of fix and flipping, if you will. You're actually not fixing your tarrant, you're, you know, you're, you're developing, you're, you're taking a property and you're going through the city planning and you're getting an architect and you're going to develop something on some, on a piece of property on a land. Maybe you're going to tear something down to do that. Maybe you're going to buy some raw land to do that. Turnkey property. What's a turnkey property? It's a property that's already been renovated by somebody else. Um, and, and running really, really well. Maybe it's got tenants in it. Maybe it's not. Right? Maybe it's maybe it's vacant, just been renovated, and you're you're buying it and you're renting it, and you're holding it. So all it's kind of like a buy and hold, except it's got no, it's turnkey, it's it's ready to go. All of these strategies come with pros and cons to them, and we could spend all day talking about just those pros and cons of these strategies, right, guys? Yep, absolutely. There's um, lots of different ways and reasons, and yeah. yeah. Understanding your situation and financial situation and comfort level and all that type of thing will really determine which way you move forward. Yeah. So Burr strategy is a personal favorite. I think everybody on the team is, it's, I would say, I don't know, like it's my personal favorite. Like now it's my personal favorite, the Burr strategy. Yep. When I first started investing, it was buy and hold. It was buy a property, do a little bit of reno to it, maybe three or four or five, six grand or something like that and hold it. Now it's, it's the Burr strategy because I like to renovate properties uh, with a team. I don't do the renovations myself, but I like to have my renovations. I like to, I like to raise the value of the property um, by, my, by my actions. With, so I don't, I'm not looking for the market to do... I don't need the market to, 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 to raise my property value. I do it myself, right? We do it ourselves through the Burr strategy. And we're able to take out a big portion of capital, recycle that capital. I love, love, love the birth strategy. And it wasn't always called the birth strategy. It was just called like equity growth back in the day, right? Now it's become very trendy to call the burr. 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 Um, house hacking. What's that? Anyone know? Anyone know? Like in, um, basically buy the house. Uh, yep. and maybe you live in a unit within the house. If it's set up as two self-contained or three self-contained, uh, or even some cases you just occupy one room mm -hmm. and you rent out the other rooms or units. Mm -hmm. There's lots of different ways, right? Like, so it's buying a property that you're going to live in and then creating, finding income producing ways to, to rent that property, right? Maybe it's a secondary suite. Maybe it's a, maybe it's like you said, renting other rooms. Maybe it's, um, renting in garages, like there's all sorts of ways to create income around owning a home, right? And the nice thing about house hacking is down payments, 5%. So you can get into properties with low down payments, right? So if you're not a married person <laughs> or you're in a married, you're a married person or in a, in a relationship and you guys are, you guys are super flexible. It's hard to do with like, you know, a family I find like I'm, I'm over the, I, I house hacked when I first started buying properties. I, every, every house I bought for the first five, six years, we had a rental unit in it. And then I realized I just didn't want a renter in my house anymore. And we started, you know, buying houses with 
with more room, right? Um, you're, did you house hack, Ara? Yeah, when I think the very first house we ever bought, it had a legal basement apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, surprisingly, I didn't even know it was legal, and then no way. find out that it was. And for the most part, usually around that time, this is around 2014, so I don't think anybody cared about legal duplex or anything like that. No, I mean, um, I, I don't think any of our uh, in-law suites were legal when I did it. Like, Yeah, so th that, was, that was good. Um, that's basically got me started. Um, and then from that one led to another and then. Yeah. It's a great way to start. Right. So I, I, I've got people we talk to all the time that are like, you know, they're just getting into investing and they're young and they've got a small down payment and they want to get into a property. And my, they, my advice to them is go buy a fourplex, live in one of the units. And then as you grow your, your business and you make more money in life, you could do it again for a second property. And then eventually just, and keep the first property. And that's a, that's, you're building your portfolio out by living in the units that you're, you're uh, living in the houses that you're investing in. Right. Um, student rentals um, is a, is a strategy, right? People do very, very well. Lots of cash flow involved with student rentals. There's some, some higher management responsibilities associated with them, obviously the tenant to tenant. And then there's some different laws around it too. I've been learning about um, in terms of rental regulation and landlord tenant stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, vacation rentals is a strategy, you know, Airbnb, um, right? more and more people doing Airbnbs, uh, in lots of markets you could, uh, so yeah, th these are all options. Okay. So, you, you know, when figuring out which one is for you is up to you, right? You're going to have to determine what it meets your goals in life and what meets your, um, your lifestyle that you want to have, you know, where do you want to be involved heavily in a, in a strategy or do you want to have it off offloaded? Um, that brings me to where will you invest? Are you going to be a local investor or are you going to be a long distance investor? Are you going to be somebody who's going to be buying in a, for, a market that's far away or are you going to invest in the town that you live in? Um, I personally moved to the investment town that from uh, that I'm investing in. So I now, I still live in the town that we, I do most of our investing. So also, we also have a real estate team and we have property management and, and so on and so forth and renovations and stuff. So I, I'm fully invested and living in the town that, um, that I'm focused on. Um, but you don't have to be. You know, I know you can invest in a far away place. Um, there, it comes with other challenges, obviously, but so does living in the town that you invest in. Um, so, you know, if you invest locally, it's you have easy oversight of your properties. You, you self management is possible, and you're close to your investments. And now that comes with sometimes stress, and sometimes you know that you always you know it's it's always on your mind. Like you know that your properties are only a a short drive away and you can go check on it. And you're like, rather than getting somebody to fix the, uh, you know, the leak in the, in the toilet there, I'm just going to pop over and do it myself. So it, locally investing has you, if you're, if you're the type of person that likes to do that, that's, that could be really good for you. If you're the type of person that knows you're going to get overwhelmed by all of these little things, you're going to have to really set boundaries in your life. You're going to be like, I don't, I don't do that. That's why I'm building a team. Does that make sense? Sure right. So long distance investing, you know, your team is going to be critical. Your team's critical when you're locally investing, but even more so when it's long distance, right? If it's long distance, you're going to need to have your team players in, in the drivers, in the seats, right? On your bus, right? You're driving the bus. You're going to need the right people on the, on the, on the, in the, in the bus, right? So your team is critical. Property management is going to be hundred percent mandatory, you're going to need to have somebody look after your properties, whether it be a property manager or like a, a repairs and maintenance person that you can rely on. Sometimes people get like just a repair and maintenance guy or a girl. They did it again, uh, guys. Um, just, you know, they, they can just take care of the property for you. There's lots of ways to, to, to figure that out, but you're going to need to figure it out. Uh, and the nice thing about a property that's invested in where you're not in the living in that town is it's separation. It's out of sight. It's out of mind. That comes with a lot of peace of mind for a lot of people. What do you guys think? Any comments on that, any of that? 
Should I just keep plugging away? Yeah, keep hammering. I mean, uh, whenever right. I'm just, analyzing I'm just, properties, I'm, I'm always looking for cash flow to make sure that if I do need to get property management, for example, that it will be covered if I can't yeah. handle it myself and you know, factor that in for sure. Yeah. Yeah. If, if there's anything you guys want to chime in on, just just come on in. Okay. Don't don't be shy. Don't let me steamroll you on that. Cause I, don't let me own the mic here. My nice new mic. Your nice fancy new <laughs> FM sounding mic. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, so the next point in the conversation as as you're thinking about investing and when you're even as you're like, even I look at this conversation, I'm like, okay, I, what can I do? What is your goal cash flow or equity? What is it? Is it cash flow or equity growth? Do you know how much cash flow you need? To become financially free, there's a we've done videos on this. We've done a whole segment on like how much money do you need? How can you derive financial freedom from your real estate investments? And you know whether you so you maybe you buy like two, three, four, five, sell off three, pay off the mortgages on two, and then you've got the cash flow from that two with no mortgage, right? And you could you know maybe that's like whatever, like what depends on your market, right? Maybe you can make three, four or five grand just doing that. Right. So you don't, and you need to know though, what is your cash flow requirement in order to pay for all your expenses? So that requires you to do a budget. That's a whole separate conversation. Um, but it's, it's an important one. How much money is, what's your daily, what's your monthly burn rate? What's your burn rate? You know, how much are you spending monthly? You know, what do you, your, and that's your, you know, your house costs, your auto costs, your food costs, your recreation, all that stuff, right? So if you want your investments to pay for, for your, your, fi- your, 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 your life, you need to know that number and then design your real estate strategy to get to that point, right? Mm-hmm. So you can get really specific or you can be just broad. It's like, I want to have equity growth and some cash flow. I want my properties to appreciate over the long run and I want them to work as a business. That's another way. That's kind of how I look at my investing. I look at my investing as a building, um, building like, like I want them to run as a business themselves. I'm not, I'm not pushing retirement any like quick, like anytime real soon, you know, like I'm not like, I got to be financially free in two years. And, and then I'm going to go, maybe I should, maybe I should change my strategy as I'm thinking about it. Um, maybe I should go for high cash flow. Mm-hmm. but I I'm investing in bring the property values up and, and look, they got to run as a business. They got to carry themselves regardless of what the market does. They got to produce some cash flow and the mortgages got to get paid down. That's the goal. 